Uh, we're going to continue in our series in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we are in chapter 12 today, church. We've been in this series for, what, a year and four months, a year and five months, going through the Gospel of Mark. We've had a couple of pit stops here and there, um, but we're finally at chapter 12. And uh, starting in chapter 11, uh, if you remember, uh, chapter 11 begins the final week in Jesus' life. So from chapter 11 on, we're in the last week of Jesus' life. And I think as I calculated the sermon series, uh, we're going to be done by, we're going to be done sometime in July. And so it's, uh, I hope it's been a great journey just going through the gospel, seeing Jesus um, and his ministry and his work and who he is. Um, I've been getting a lot uh, throughout this year, throughout the series, like, man, I didn't know that was in the Bible, or I didn't know about this, or I don't know about that. And so it's just been really cool to see us going systematically through the gospel of Mark um, as God speaks to us. But today, like I said, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open it to Mark chapter 12. And as you're opening your Bibles, let me set the context for this uh, passage. If you remember, like I said, in Mark chapter 11, it begins the final week of Jesus's, uh, the final week of Jesus's life. And so uh, in Mark chapter 11, we see Jesus on a colt going into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, okay? He goes to Jerusalem and he scopes it out. He doesn't like what he sees. He goes back to Bethany about two miles away from Jerusalem uh, to kind of come up with his plan of what he's going to do the next day. The next day he goes back to Jerusalem. If you remember on the way there, he curses a fig tree because it didn't bear any fruit. And if you remember, um, uh, that fig tree represented Israel. So he goes, uh, he goes into the temple, cleanses the temple, leaves uh, back to Bethany and returns again, which is now Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Uh, on his way back, he sees the fig tree again, and he uses it as an opportunity for an object lesson on prayer. Then last week, we saw that um, Jesus had some conflict with the religious leaders of the day, uh, questioning his authority, rejecting who Jesus is. And it's still Tuesday, and we're going to see more conflict uh, with the religious leaders. So we're, we're still on Tuesday. We haven't moved past that. So there's going to be a lot of conflict with the religious leaders today. So let's go ahead and read today's passage. It says this. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and at least it to the tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Verse 4. And again, again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and it treated him shamefully. And he sent another and they killed him. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent, to him the, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your scriptures. They are holy. They are inerrant. They are infallible. They are authoritative to our lives. And God, I pray today through this parable that Jesus gave the religious leaders, that you, Jesus, would speak to us through your Holy Spirit. 
Spirit, lead us. Spirit, guide us. Spirit, instruct us today. Open our heart and soften our heart for your word. God, we submit to you as both Savior and Lord. And we submit to your Son by submitting to your word today. Lead us and guide us in our time together. We love you. We thank you. And we honor you. In your name we pray. Amen. And amen. Last week, we talked about some of the reasons why people reject Jesus, why people reject God. We talked about three of those reasons in the passage that was before us, um, and through those three reasons were submission. Uh, people do not want to submit to the authority of God. They want to be their own authority. One of the other reasons was denial of the evidence. Uh, people deny the evidence of God's existence. They deny the evidence of God's power, and therefore they just simply do not want to submit or give their life to Jesus. And lastly, we saw the fear of man. What are people going to say about me? What are people going to reject me? What consequences am I going to have? And so we saw some of the reasons, while there's many more other reasons why people reject Jesus in the passage last week, we saw those three. Today, we're really going to look at this, this question. How does Jesus respond when people reject him? So we saw that last week that people reject Jesus, but how will God respond now when people reject him? That's the big question for today. How will God respond and how does God respond? How has God responded in the past when people reject him? And what we're going to see is not only how God responds to people who reject him, we're going to see uh, it's going to be a display of his nature It's going to be a display of who God is. It's going to be a display of God's person as we see why or how he responds to people who reject God. So not only are we going to see his response, but it's going to be a reflection or a display of who he is. Okay? You guys tracking with me? All right. And here's the thing. Uh, There's going to be four, four ways that God responds, and I want to give you the first one today, and it's this. The patience of God. God responds to people who reject him with patience. Let's read verses 1 through 5. It says this, And he began to speak to them in parables. So Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. He says, A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to the tenants, and he went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. When when, When people respond to God with rejection, God responds to people with patience. Now I want to point out a few things. Uh, Here, Mark tells us that Jesus was speaking to them. Who's the them in this passage? The them is the religious leaders of the day, the scribes, the chief priests, the elders, which make up the Sanhedrin. Uh, If you remember what the Sanhedrin was, it was 70 men who had a lot of political and religious power. Kind of think about it like as their supreme court. And so he's talking to them, and as he's talking to them, the crowd is around Jesus, and they're in the temple. They're in the temple. Jesus is speaking to them. He's about to tell them a parable. Now, what is a parable? A parable is simply a story that illustrates a spiritual reality. That's what it is. It's a story where Jesus is going to try to make a point of a spiritual reality, and Jesus is going to use a parable that is very, very familiar to the people of his day. Okay? Now, let's understand the parable first, and then we'll see what the meaning of the parable is. So let's understand the parable. Uh, First, in order to understand the parable, uh, we need to see all of the work that the owner of this vineyard put in to plant the vineyard, right? Uh, Jesus says that a man, the owner, the landowner, planted a vineyard. So he, he planted the vineyard. And not only did he plant the vineyard, he put a fence around the vineyard to protect it from 
wild animals or from other people, so he, he put a fence around it to protect it. He, he dug a pit so that the wine could drop into this pit. He built a tower. So a, a tower back then for the, for in vineyards was for storage, it was for shelter, and it was also for, for protection. And not only did he plant the vineyard, not only did he put a fence around to protect it, did he dig a well so he can get the wine, he built a tower, but he then leased it. He leased it to other tenants or farmers, people who he trusted, so that those tenants, those farmers, could then produce fruit. Okay, that's where we're at so far. Then, Jesus says that this owner of the vineyard sent his servant to collect some of the fruit. And that was very typical of the day. About half to a third of the produce had to be given to the owner. About half of it to a third. And so this, this landowner, he was simply requesting what was rightfully his, wasn't he? That's my vineyard. Those are, I leased it to you. Yes, you could keep some of it for your benefit, but I, I put this in, I did all this work and it put you in charge so that it could bear fruit. And so he sent a servant, and what happened to servant number one? He got beat. He got beat, and they sent him away empty handed. And what did the owner do? He sent another servant, right? And what did they do with that guy? They struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. Notice the progression, notice the escalation, because what happens to servant number three? They kill him. They kill him. And Mark tells us, or Jesus tells us, that he sent many others. Many others were beaten, many others were killed. And so just think about the tenants for a second. Think about the farmers. They're killing and beating these servants. What are they thinking of the landowner? This guy must be crazy. Like, who in the world continues to send servants into danger, knowing that they're going to get beaten, knowing that they're going to get killed, servant after servant after servant after servant after servant? So, what does this really mean then? What does this parable really mean? Church, in order to understand the parable, we need to understand the backdrop and what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is actually quoting a scripture from Isaiah chapter 5. Let me read it to you. It's going to sound very familiar. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. This is God planting vineyard. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of its stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. And he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it. Uh, he looked for it to yield grapes or fruit, but it yielded wild grapes. It yielded bad grapes. And so, think about it. The religious leaders—they're smart. The people are smart, and they're like, "That sounds familiar. That's that sounds like Isaiah chapter five. And in the in the Isaiah context, God did the work of planting Israel in Judah hoping that they would produce good fruit, that they would produce good grapes. But what happened? They didn't produce good fruit or good grapes. They produced wild, unfruitful uh, grapes. Therefore, if you continue to read Isaiah, God brought destruction and judgment upon them. So now they're, the religious leaders are like, oh, okay, I know that passage. I know that passage. So what's going on here? Right? I, I know that. Now, we understand the backdrop. We have to understand the characters or who symbolizes what in this passage. The man or the landowner represents God. The vineyard is Israel. The tenants, the wicked farmers, represent the religious leaders of the day. The servants represent the Old Testament prophets. And the beloved son represents Jesus. So let's put it all together. Let's put it all together. What does it mean? God planted Israel and gave the tenants, the religious leaders of the day, charge 
to lead the people of Israel so they could produce good fruit, to be a light to the nations. However, they produced nothing but rebellion and sinfulness and unfaithfulness and no fruit at all. Yet God sent his servants, Old Testament prophets, time and time and time again to call Israel back to repentance, to call Israel back to faithfulness and fruitfulness. But what did the religious establishment do? They rejected the prophets. They beat the prophets. They killed the prophets. Hebrews chapter 11, this is what some of the prophets had to do or went through. This is what it says about the prophets. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Most people think that's Isaiah, that he was sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. Patience, the patience of God. I'm sending you my servant, you reject me. I'm sending you my servant, you reject me. I'm sending you another one and another one. And he keeps sending people. Isn't that just patience? The amazing patience of our God? That even when people reject him, he is so patient. He is so patient with us. If you, at every church, there's both believers and unbelievers at every church. If you don't know Jesus, if he's not your savior, he has been so patient with you. Sending you servants, messages after messages after messages. Why? Why? So that you can repent so that you can come to him. And he's been so patient. He's been waiting for you. Second Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Romans 2, 4, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. The reason why Jesus hasn't come back a second time is so that you have time to repent and believe. He's patient. And God has been sending you servants, a family member, a friend, a co-worker, a situation. And you've been rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. And today, he sent me to tell you he's patient and he's waiting for you to come home. The patience of our God. For those who don't know him yet, I love what Augustine says. This is so powerful. He says, God has promised forgiveness to our repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. Let me read that again. God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. Meaning, tomorrow is not promised. Today is the day for salvation. Today is the day for eternity. Eternity matters today. But he's patient. But he won't be patient forever. Believer, as I said, this is how God responds to people who reject him, right? But it's also a display of his character, that he's a patient God. And so we, as the church, as the body, should also display the very same patience that God gave us, right? One of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. I am very impatient with people. Just ask my wife, okay? 
And she's very patient with me. I mean, she's like, she's so holy. She doesn't sin. She's perfect. I mean, she's, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lot to put up with. Patience, church. Patience with people. And guess what? Patience especially with the people that are closest to us, right? Because for whatever reason, our fuse is a lot shorter with the people that are closer to us, our family, our friends, or those people that we really care about. We can be a little more patient with other people. But church, God has been so patient to you, believer. Let's be patient with other people. Let's be gracious with other people, especially people in our own home. Because how are we going to be patient in the world, we can't even be patient in our house. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm the messenger. I'm just, don't kill me. I'm the messenger. The patience of God. That's how he responds to rejection. Number two, the love of God. When people reject him, he still responds with love. Verse six. He had still one other, a beloved son, Jesus. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. The inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Again, let's understand the passage. And I think this one's a little easier to understand. So the landowner sent servant after servant after servant. They keep killing him and beating him. Finally, at a certain point, he sends his son, his beloved son, his unique son, his only son. I mean, can you just think about, again, the landowners. Think about the, the landowners again. They see the son coming from afar. What are they thinking? This guy must be crazy. He sends the servants. We beat them. We kill him. And now he sends his son? This guy, this guy must have a few screws loose. To be doing that. And so he sends his son nonetheless. Just think about the amazing love. Servants are many, especially in that time, and could be easily replaced, while a son is unique and irreplaceable. Just think about the love of this landowner to these people. And so what happened? They killed him. They killed the beloved Son, and they said, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. There's a possibility, there's a possibility that the landowners actually thought that the father was dead. That's why they said, let us kill him so the inheritance is ours. There's a possibility that they might have thought that, right? Again, it's a parable. Let's not read too much into it. And they killed him. They killed the son. So what does that really mean, right? I think this one's really easy to understand and interpret, right? And the best way to get the meaning of this parable is John 3.16. That's the meaning of the parable. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal and everlasting life. That's the meaning of the parable. That God so loved, and the word so there emphasizes the greatness and the intensity of his love. So, that he loved the world so much that he sent his son. The world, the word world in the gospel of John, it's not really a reference to the bigness of the world. It's a reference to the badness of the world. Wickedness, rebellion against God, sinfulness, evil world. And isn't that what's happening in this parable? These wicked evil, horrible tenants have been killing his servants, finally killed his son. The love that is there. He sent his son despite the wickedness of the servants. God sent his one and only son, Jesus, despite the wickedness and rebellion of the world. God sent the son he loved to a world that hated him. That is love. That is love. Again, unbeliever. God sent his son to die so that you can live. God sent his son to die so that you can live. He's been patient with you. 
He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to give you life forever, beginning today, eternal life. Believer, 1 John chapter 4, 19 says that we love because he first loved us. While you and I, believer, were dead in our sin, God demonstrated his love for us while we were sinners. He loved us. And we as his children, as his followers, must display that same love to a dying and broken world the same way that God displayed his love for us. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. We must be people of love. And guess what? We must love the people that are very difficult to love. That's when it really matters. The people who oppose us, the people who oppose the gospel, the people that are just difficult, right? A coworker that just, it's hard to love that person. A friend, a family member. Don't look at each other. Don't look at each other. You might give a hint. We must love. I, 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 I was reminded of loving people, especially who oppose you, by this quote that Paul Washer, one of my favorite theologians, said. He says this. He says, all of your reformed theology and good doctrine will be annulled if you do not outlove those who oppose you. Let me read that again. All of your reformed theology and good doctrine will be annulled if you do not outlove those who oppose you. It doesn't matter how much we know. It doesn't matter how much theology you know. It is trash if we don't love people. Don't talk about the doctrines of grace if you can't express grace to somebody. We must love. What good is it to know the biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, when we can't really speak the language of love? We must love. We must love people. We must. Now, here's the thing. I think a lot of the times, church, we don't love people because we doubt that God actually loves us. We doubt God loves us. You know what kind of game we play with God sometimes? He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. I went to church today. He loves me. I served today. He loves me. I gossiped today and talked about a coworker. He doesn't love me. I was using my words in a terrible way. He loves me not. Hey, though, I gave to the church. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Believer, can I just tell you something today? God loves you. He loves you. God loves you. And there is nothing, Romans chapter 8, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us, believers, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He loves you. Don't doubt it. Embrace it. Receive it. And let that love just captivate your soul and captivate your heart so that you can express that love to people and reflect his character. You are loved, church. Now, I want to put a little pause on our sermon and get, take a little pit stop. Is that okay? Okay, that's great. I'm glad you're on the same page. Okay. I want to just pause because... I've been wanting to talk to you guys about something for a long time that's very, very important. And I haven't 
been able to do that. And this is the perfect time because we're talking about the love of God. And I want to ask you a question, actually. The question is this. Does God love everyone equally? Does God love everyone equally? Does God love a believer the same way that he loves an unbeliever? I'll give you my answer first and I'll explain. The answer is no. He doesn't. He doesn't. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. So many times in our modern church, the pastor stands up, looks to his audience and says, God loves you just the way you are. Then he says, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. We've seen that, right? He has. Now remember, at every church, there's believers and non-believers. That's what happens. And so what happens is, here's what happens. The pastor says, God loves you the way you are. And to the believer, yes, that's very true. He loves me and he sees me through the righteousness of Christ. What does an unbeliever think? Hold on a second. I'm rebelling against God. I'm living a sinful lifestyle. And God loves me? That's pretty awesome. So I don't have to change anything? If he loves me the way I am, I don't have to change anything? Then he says, God has a plan for your life. So wait, hold on. I'm I'm sinning. I don't need to change. God loves me. And now God has a plan for my life. (laughs) This is awesome. This is amazing. Like, I'm right with God then. I'm good with God. And then what happens? They leave our church, our churches, with half truths. They leave thinking they are right with God when they are not. It's a half-truth, church. It is. Yes, God loves us where we are at, but his love doesn't leave us where we're at. He calls us to holiness. He calls us to repentance. He calls us to surrender. He calls us to obedience. But that doesn't get preached these days. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I have an idea, but I'm not going to say it. I don't know. His love doesn't leave us where we're at. And yes, God does have a purpose for our lives. Let me, can I just show you? Can you grab your Bibles? Can you, can you go to John 3.16 for a second? John 3.16. Purpose for our life, right? God has a purpose for your life? Okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If you believe in him, God has a purpose for you, and that's eternal life, right? Okay. But here's the thing. Too many times we stop at John 3.16. There's John 3.17. There's John 3, 18. Why don't we ever continue reading what it says in John? Skip to John chapter 3, the very same chapter. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but what? But the wrath of God remains on him. Yes, there is a purpose that God has for the unbeliever, and that is the full fury and wrath of God poured upon his life. But why don't we ever preach that? Half-truths are full lies. They are. I love what R.C. Sproul helps us understand this. 
You see, God's love, there's aspects to God's love. There's, there's, and he really helps us in by giving us three aspects of God's love. And I want to share them with you, why God doesn't love everyone the same. First, I love what he talks about. He talks about God's love of benevolence. God's love of benevolence. What does this mean? It means a kind of spirit to the whole world. His goodwill and attitude towards all humanity. So God's love of benevolence is God's attitude or will towards all of the world, both believers and unbelievers. For example, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's his attitude. That's his will to a dying world, both believers and unbelievers. But I want you to notice something about John 3, 16. It doesn't say that he loves everyone equally, right? And it doesn't say that he loves everyone in order to save everyone. Because if he loved everyone with a saving love, why are people in hell right now? God's love of benevolence, his attitude towards the world, God's love. Second aspect of God's love, God's love of beneficence. God's love of beneficence. How, this is how he displays his actions. The first one's benevolence is his attitude. This is his actions towards the world. Theologians and scholars call this, call this common grace. Common grace, where God blesses and provides for the believer and for the unbeliever. For example, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 5.45, it says that rain will fall on the just and the unjust. That rain will fall on the saved and the non-saved. That God will provide for the the saved and the not saved. It's his common grace, action towards people. But then there's a special love that God has only for those who are in his son. This is called the, the love of complacency. It's the biblical love of complacency. It's a special love that God has for his son and all those that are in his son. And that are adopted in his family. Think about it. I just read you Romans chapter 8, 38 through 39. That nothing could separate you from the love of God. That is to a believer. In heaven, we will experience, and now we will experience the love of God. An unbeliever in hell will not experience the love of God. But will experience his wrath and condemnation. God doesn't love everyone the same. He doesn't. And God's love of complacency does have a condition, church. We always talk about God's love being unconditional, unconditional. It has a condition. Repent and believe. Be in his son if you want that special if anything, if you read the scriptures, the scriptures actually say that God doesn't love the wicked. He hates the wicked. Church, some of you are like, what's the big deal about this, man? Why are you getting all crazy about this? It matters. It matters. And the other thing is, be careful what kind of preaching you sit under. Be careful what you're listening to. Seriously. Seriously, be careful. Because we could be giving false hope to people that are going straight to hell. Back on track. Point number three. The judgment of God. The judgment of God. Verse nine. What will the owner of the vineyard do then? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. The owner comes and destroys the tenants. The owner will bring judgment upon those who've killed his servants, but most importantly, his son. And after he has done that, he will give the vineyard to others. What does this mean? In regards to destroying the tenants, in this context, in this biblical context, it is judgment against Israel. And remember that judgment. It was the temple, AD 70, destroyed, completely destroyed in AD 70. That is the judgment here. That Jesus is talking about. 
What does he mean by giving the vineyard to others? This is what essentially it means. Jesus is saying, hey, religious leaders, you guys did a terrible job of stewarding my people. You did a terrible job of leading my people, and so now I'm going to give the vineyard to others. Who are the others? It begins with Jesus and the 12, and then it goes down from there to all of the church leaders who were Gentiles over time. New church leaders that are going to steward uh, uh, God's new building, God's new temple after the destruction of AD 70. It's no longer a man-made temple, but it's a spiritual temple. And the new leaders, the new church leaders are going to shepherd the sheep, leader after leader after leader until today. He said, hey, you guys couldn't do it. I'm going to pass on the responsibility of stewarding my vineyard. The judgment of God. Unbeliever. The judgment of God is real. And it's true. And if you're not in Christ, you won't experience that. Yes, he's patient. Yes, he's loving. But he's also a just God. And I'm thankful he's a just God. He will punish sin. He will make all things right. And listen, you could reject the love of God. You could reject the patience of God. But you cannot reject the judgment of God upon your life. You can't. Come to him. Come to him today. Believer, when it comes to the judgment of God, We have work to do. We have work to do. We must preach the gospel. We must share the gospel. But friends and family members that don't know Jesus, that are headed towards judgment, man, we got a lot of praying to do. That God would draw them in, don't we? Because the judgment is real. And lastly, my last point, I know I'm running a little late. The triumph of God. The triumph of God. Jesus says, have you not read this scripture? He says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. That's what he says. The triumph of God. Jesus now switches from a vineyard to a building. And guess what he's doing? Again, the backdrop behind what Jesus is doing. This is actually a quote from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 was quoted when? At his triumphal entry when he was riding in on a colt. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what he said. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was Psalm 118 as as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. And so now Jesus goes back to that same psalm and says, you want to quote a psalm, I'll quote you a psalm. And he quotes that. He quotes the psalm of the cornerstone. That the builders rejected the cornerstone. This rejection implies or indicates crucifixion. To reject Christ was to crucify Christ. But the stone that was rejected became the cornerstone. The stone that was rejected and crucified will come back as the most important stone. And this is speaking of his resurrection. So the death of Jesus wasn't final. Yes, they rejected him. Yes, they crucified him. Yes, he died. But he came back not as the rejected cornerstone, but as the resurrected cornerstone. What God, what what man rejects, God uses for his glory. And the cornerstone was the most important stone in a building structure. It was the most important stone. It gave this, this building and the structure stability and symmetry. It was the most important stone where everyone else and every other stone was aligned. And the stone that the builders rejected 
became the most important stone. The humiliated stone becomes the exalted stone. The stone that nobody wanted became the stone that everybody needed. Acts chapter 4, verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The cornerstone. What was rejected gets resurrected. Most important stone that we have is Christ. He triumphs. He's victorious. Jesus did not stay in the grave. And check this out. Look what the, look what the passage says. I love this. This was the Lord's doing. The Lord did it. God did it. Meaning that he is completely in control of Jesus' life. He is completely in control of Jesus' final week. He is completely in control of all of redemptive history. That he is the sovereign God working out his perfect plan before the foundation of the world. This was the Lord's doing. God did it. He resurrected him by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring salvation to people. Look what it says. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Marvelous. The word marvelous there means wonder and amazement. Can we just marvel? And be in amazement of who God is. Can we just marvel, church, at the patience that God has displayed upon our hearts, upon our lives? Remember, believer, when you rejected God time and time again, I do. Can we just marvel that he was so patient with us that he didn't give up on the first try but kept on sending people, friends, family, a co-worker, a pastor to finally we gave in. Can we just sit in awe of the love of God that he loved us so much that he sent his son, his unique beloved son to die for us. And that as believers, we have that confidence and assurance that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Can we marvel that we have a God who is just, who doesn't let sin go unpunished. That is not a just God, and that is not a holy God. But let's marvel at his holiness, at his justice. Let's marvel at his triumph, that he was victorious, although he was rejected. And we will be rejected in this world, but one day we will reign with Christ in victory and in triumph. There's so much to be thankful for. Don't let thankfulness happen one time a year. You live a life of thankfulness and marvel at who Jesus is who God is.
I want to end with this. How does a parable end? Verse 12, and they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This was their opportunity for repentance. This was their opportunity to surrender. This was the opportunity to submit their lives to Christ. But they simply went away. The question is, will you go away too? Or will you surrender your life to Jesus? God, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for this passage. We thank you for this parable. Thank you for your word. It's so powerful. It speaks to us. I pray that if there's someone here today, or someone watching online who has rejected you over and over and over again, may your love, your patience, grace just be poured upon them. May you draw them to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. May you cause new life. May you regenerate their soul. Your word says that if someone comes to you, you will not cast them out. But you're, but you're waiting with arms wide open to give life, to give hope, to give joy, to give freedom, to give eternal life that only, is only found in you, Jesus. We pray for believers. That we could continue to express that patience and love to a world, to reflect your character, God. God, we love you. We thank you. We marvel. We sit under your feet. We surrender our lives and we're in awe we can't even comprehend it we can't even fully grasp it but yet we stand in awe of you god we love you we thank you in your name we pray